I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Uh, very, very thankful to be here. I'm, I'm thankful for the opportunity to share the gospel this morning. And, uh, and I hope this week that you have done the exact same thing in terms of sharing the gospel. Uh, inviting people to church, showing people the love of Christ uh, in, in various ways that you may do. Uh, I, I mentioned last week in Romans chapter 11 uh, that the Bible shows us that both the Jew and the Gentile have been given the power to reject, the possibility uh, to be reconciled, and been provided the path to redemption. And we saw, we saw God's people, God's chosen people, Israel, despite their overwhelming showing of rejection, was not cast out of God's plan. Let me say that again. Despite their repeated rejection, despite the fact that they messed up over and over again, they were never completely casted out of God's plan. In fact, the scriptures will tell us that there is a remnant, just as there, were, uh, there, there was in the days of Elijah, there is still a remnant of God's people who continue to place their faith in Jesus and place their faith in God. Now, the next part of Romans chapter 11 brings forth the idea that Israel's disbelief has actually resulted in an expansion of God's people. Can you believe that bad things can happen? but somehow God uses that to bring about better things? Do you believe this morning that God can take somebody who's filthy and wretched and full of sin and immoral and cause them to do things for him that nobody thought was possible? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, guess what? You are that person. I am that person. God takes bad things and turns them into something powerful for him. He's done that with Israel. As Romans chapter 11 will tell us, his grace has reached the Gentiles, the, the non-Jew, and has made the possibility to be reconciled to him. And by the way, that possibility is available to all, which is why I said I hope this week that you have shared the gospel, you've showed the love of Christ, you've invited people to church to hear what God can do in their lives as he has done, hopefully, in yours. As it was said in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 30, In the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commanded that all men everywhere repent. Now, I like that phrase, winked at, because do you know what winked at means there in the book of Acts? It means that God overlooks stupidity. Amen? He, he turns a blind eye, in essence, to um, just the, the, the terrible nature that human beings have. And, and he, or rather, uh, he, he looks favorably upon those who trust in Jesus by faith. Is anybody thankful this morning that our God overlooks stupidity? I am. I, I sure am. Um, all have the opportunity to be saved. We said this, everybody. We, we say this a lot. Um, but do we believe it? And we can say we believe it, but do we practice it by making sure everybody knows that's around us? Of course, everybody's given the opportunity to be saved, but not everybody seizes such an opportunity. Um, if you have your Bibles, join me, please. We're going to continue in Romans chapter 11 this week. Um, turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter 11. We'll start in verse 13. And uh, as we start, I'm, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads in a moment of prayer with me. Uh, as we ask the Lord to bless this time that we have together. Father, I thank you and I praise you uh, for all that you are and all that you do. Father, thank you for the opportunity of salvation made possible through Jesus Christ. I pray that as we read your word this morning, Father, as a congregation, that we, uh, we do so with humbled hearts and, Father, unprejudiced minds. Uh, without bias. Father, I pray that this word will be a lamp to the feet, a light to our paths uh, of everyone who may hear it. Uh, may this time together that we have reading your word reach the lost as well as strengthen and motivate the Christian. And Father, it is in the name of Jesus I pray these things. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we go through this, we're going to look at the second part of Romans chapter 11 and 
if you're a Christian, here's the three things that we're going to take away from this this morning. Here it is. The first is, if you're a Christian, you're being looked at. Now, uh, I don't want to uh, get the conspiracy theorists all riled up. We're not talking about a, uh, a, a 1984 situation here. Uh, and if you get my, my reference, great. If you don't, that's okay. Save it. Ask me about it later. Uh, so if you're a Christian... You are being looked at. Secondly, if you're a Christian, you are branches that have been linked together with Israel. And third, uh, if you are a Christian, then you must be loyal. You must bear loyalty. Here's what God's Word tells us. Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be, the receiving of them be, but life from the dead. We'll stop right there. As I mentioned a second ago, the first thing that I would like to show you in God's word here this morning is that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a genuine Christian, then that means you are being looked at. Now, what does that mean? Uh, you're being looked at by your brothers and sisters in Christ. You're, you're being observed by your fellow believer. You're being watched also by the unbeliever. You're being judged, whether it's fair or not, by the world. And if we're honest with ourselves, being judged by the follower of Jesus as well, even though that is improper in most circumstances. And what are they looking for? What is it that people are looking for when they observe your life, when they're, when they're trying to see what you do? Here is what I believe the world is looking for. You want to know why I know? Because I myself was an unbeliever once upon a time. And when I looked upon people who said that they followed Jesus Christ, I looked for consistency. I looked for things uh, th that lined up with what they, what they claimed they did and who they were. Here's what people look for. Do you practice what you preach? Christian, this morning, I'll ask you that question. Do you practice what you preach? Do you carry out the things? Do you behave the way you say you believe? Do you live by what you say you believe? And what does that look like? Well, in the presence of fellow Christians, consider the advice that was given to the Corinthians. They regarded themselves to be more spiritually mature, more, more spiritually minded in certain aspects, and, and that caused them to believe that they could live a life however they saw fit. They could do whatever they wanted to do. Why? They felt, they felt this sense of, of spiritual superiority. And unfortunately, as human beings, we allow that to set in sometimes. We feel as if we're somehow better. We serve the way we're supposed to serve. We, we think the way we're supposed to think. And, it, and it's human nature for us to allow those fleshly thoughts to creep in. But, but remember what was said to the Corinthians. They were advised in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You know what that means? That means people who are weaker in the faith are watching you. How do you react? For some Christians, uh, you set the tone. Amen? If you feel it's okay to be a downer, well, people weak in the faith will say, hey, yeah, I guess it's okay because this person who's been faithfully serving and, and following Jesus, well, that's okay too. If you're a complainer, if, if you're a gossiper, if people observe that in your life, people weaker in the faith can say, hey, that must be okay too. Because these people who are, who, are, who are seasoned Christians, well, hey, you know, they do it. It must be all right. It must be permittable according to God's word. So Christian, you and I, we're looked at. We're observed by our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Secondly, when mingling with the unbelievers, there's nobody that I know personally that is completely surrounded by faithful followers of Jesus Christ all the time. At work, at home, when you go out to, to public events, there is no one who can uh, genuinely say a majority of the time that they are always surrounded 
by fellow Christians. So when we're, when we're out in the world, when we're with the unbelievers, um, we, have to, we have to realize and recognize that to them, they watch you, they watch me, they watch us to see what Jesus is really about. You may very well be the first scripture and sometimes the only scripture that they will ever hear. You may be the first worship and the only worship that they ever see. The first glimpse of Jesus Christ that they ever get just might be because you're living your life in obedience to God. And that's an important responsibility. That is something that you and I, if you're a Christian this morning, you should not take lightly. We are called ambassadors of Christ. That means that we're here to be that light in this dark world. We're here to, to share and proclaim the truth of what God has done and continues to do. And we're challenged to live that way. In Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, God's word says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, towards people who are not believers. Redeeming the time, let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. That means not only should we, uh, should we be practically doing the right things, but we should have an answer ready to share why we have the hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you and I look at our behavior over the past week, we don't have to go further than that. Have we met the bar of making sure that everybody we come into contact with knows without a doubt that we have the love of Christ, especially toward them? A lot of us, and I'll just throw myself under the bus, a lot of us can probably say no. And that challenges us, at least it should challenge us, to remember that we're ambassadors of Christ. Now listen, look, I'm going to stop beating, on the, on the, beating up on the, um, the believer this morning. Let me tell you this, this morning, listen up. If you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're uncertain, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have made a profession of faith, but you're not living in any way, shape, or form uh, the way the Bible calls you to live, if you, uh, you don't pray, you don't read the Bible, you may show up to, uh, to church, but that's about the length or the depth of your faith. Uh, well, here, this is for you. If you're not saved this morning, then you're being looked at too. And it doesn't matter who else you're being looked at by. Most importantly, you're being looked at by God. And let me tell you to heed his word as it was communicated by Peter uh, in Acts chapter 2. Here's what it said. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This morning... If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, let me implore you, don't put it off. Repent and be baptized. If you want to be baptized right now, we'll wait a few hours and we can fill the baptism pool up. But if you're interested in being baptized, you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've never been baptized, guess what? We're going to have a baptism after service next Sunday. I'd love for you to jump right in there too. Amen. But more importantly... Understanding baptism doesn't save you. It is a true confession of sin and it's a repentance of sin. <laughs> that means you're turning away from it. You're not engaging in it. You're no longer doing it or desire to do it any longer. Now, why? Back to Romans chapter 11. Why in the context of this chapter is it important to realize you're being looked at? Because after all, remember I said chapters 9, 10, and 11 are all dealing with the fact of Israel's unbelief. Well, Paul explains that Israel's rejection rendered a way for the Gentiles to be reconciled. A way for you and I, if you're not an ethnic Jew this morning, uh, for you and I to be reconciled to God. And because of this, there were questions about why this was not happening amongst the Jewish people. Paul was hoping it would cause his fellow kinsmen, his his fellow uh, Jew, it would cause them to want to be saved 
because they were seeing so many non-Jews won to the Lord. He thought it might in some way inspire. The King James here says provoke them into finally accepting Jesus for who he is. And if you don't know this morning, he is the Christ. He is the Messiah, the Savior of humanity. And he was hoping that this would cause them to say, you know what? Everything that Jesus claimed to be, He actually is. Look at the work He's doing amongst these non-Jews, these, these people who were not special to God, who were not chosen by God. Yet God is doing may, uh, many works and miracles through them. However, that can cause the non-Jew, that could cause the, the Gentile Christian to kind of feel like, well, look at us. We, we've been elevated somehow. Because the Jews messed up so often, God moved on to us. But understand this, Paul cautions, he calls for the Gentiles to be careful and to be cautious. Because if it is possible for the non-Jews who are saved, or rather it is possible for the non-Jews who were saved, that they could find themselves in the time of behaving arrogantly toward the unbeliever, it could cause them issues as well. Later on, we'll see that, they, uh, that we're told that we can be cut off. By the way, that's still sound advice for today. And by the way, Paul's message has been consistent because he said the same thing to the Jewish, uh, the, the Jewish Christians in chapter 2. That's why this idea of, of uh, our, our salvation is not based upon how we behave after confessing Christ. Uh, by the way, if it were possible that once you claimed, you prayed a prayer, and you followed Jesus Christ, for you to never, ever have the possibility, the possibility to become an apostate, to, to turn your back on God, well, if you need any other scriptures, look at this one. Because it says that unbelief, disbelief does what? Cuts you off. And we'll get there in a second. Romans chapter 11 verse 15 explains how Jesus' de Jesus's death made it possible for you and for me, for everyone to be united with God. Is anybody thankful for that this morning? The severed relationship has the, the option to be repaired. Jesus made that possible. And Paul hoped for a conversion of his people even though he was called to minister to the non-Jew. If you, if you ever uh, spent any time in the book of Acts, you may recall that, that Paul, he had it all figured out. He knew he was going to be there. He was going to serve in Jerusalem. He was going to witness to the Jew because who else, who else would be better to serve and minister to the Jews because he was the, he was the Pharisee. He was the one that was so zealous for Judaism that he was murdering Christians. And he just knew that if he could tell his story, his testimony, if he could talk about how he had been converted, he would be the most powerful missionary to the Jews in history. And sometimes we can make things make a lot of sense in our own minds. People are gifted with the ability to just say things that they, uh, uh, to make them make sense. Lawyers get paid to do that. They take guilty people and make them look innocent or get them off on technicalities. But it doesn't matter how well you can justify or explain what you think is right. Ultimately, God's plan is what we should follow. And Paul knew that he should, so he went and became, a, he became an apostle to the Gentiles. Now, even though he was called to minister to the non-Jew, he still had a heart for his people. Do you have a heart for your people, for your family, for your household, for your family, for your friends, for your neighborhood, for your community? Do you have a heart for your people? That's an important, le uh, an important lesson for us all. It's very easy, and I'm talking to the, the Christian who's faithfully serving right now. And, and once again, I'll put myself at the top of the list. It is very easy for us to get siloed away from the grand scheme of things in God's ministry. Having a soft spot for certain things, a, a sense of nostalgia for tradition, or a pet project, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good that we're passionate about things of God. Above all, engaging in what God has called you to do, that's extremely important. 
But you and I must never neglect praying for other areas of ministry. We should never neglect supporting other areas of ministry that we have not been called to, just like Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 11 and 10 and 9, that he has a heart for his people. For instance, as a church, we should pray for and, and support every aspect of ministry here at Grace. Not just the things we're passionate about. We should be just as con uh, concerned, not about just adult worship, but we, we should be caring for, for the ministry to the children as well. We should not only worry about the pulpit, but, but to the music, the praise, and the worship also. We should not just be concerned with Sunday morning worship. We should be concerned with Sunday school and, and, and small groups throughout the week and, and, and Bible study on Wednesdays. We shouldn't just be passionate about one area of ministry. We shouldn't be preoccupied with worship that goes on between uh, these four walls. Uh, but instead, we should also be passionate about taking God's word outside of these walls to the people who are around us, even though Paul was called to the Gentiles, he still desired that Israel would be saved. So you and I likewise should hope and pray that all forms of ministry, whether they be of grace or not, are successful and that people are reached for Christ. Paul believed that a fruitful ministry to the Gentiles would provoke the Jews to turn to Christ. That was not just for his time, but even for now. We, if you're a Christian this morning, we being followers of Jesus are looked at by the world. Your witness, your behavior, my witness, my conduct has a tremendous impact on the, on the effect, or rather has a tremendous impact, a tremendous effect on the people that are around us. And how so? Because I know there's some people, and I've said something to this effect before, I know there's some people who are sitting in here right now who are saying, uh, my testimony for Christ isn't impacting anyone. My lifestyle isn't impacting anyone. This must not be meant for me. But I want you to consider this. If you were apathetic about going to church, if you're, uh, if you're lackadaisical about worship, how do you expect anyone else to be excited to go to church too? If you, if you never invite people to church, how can you ever say, oh, well, we're down a number this week. Not a lot of people going there. It wasn't like it was 30 years ago. That's not a shot at anybody. I'm just saying. If we're apathetic about worship, how can we expect anybody else to be excited about worship? If you act like it's a burden to follow the Lord, if you act like it's a burden to follow Jesus, how can you expect no one or someone else to have the desire to serve Him? We're looked at. If you act like reading the Bible is boring, how could you ever expect someone else to, to want to study it? To want to know it? If you act like prayer is inconvenient or your schedule is too busy, how can you expect someone else who looks to you to take the time to communicate with God? See, it's important what we do. People are looking at us. Sometimes we're the litmus test for spirituality in another person's life. You want to know how I got to grace? Someone invited me. You want to know how they got to grace? Someone invited them. You want to know how I got led to the Lord? I came to this church, sat on that pew where Brother Dan Reset sat, sat right there, and I heard the gospel preached for nearly a month. And I finally got to the place where I realized I needed to call upon the name of the Lord. We are looked at, so we should act accordingly. You and I are looked at, as by, uh, looked at by, by both the believer and the non-believer. And the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you, ho or, excuse me, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That means that the broken body of Christ, the blood that was shed, makes you righteous before God if you put your faith and trust in it. If you're an unbeliever this morning, if you don't know if you're saved, that's the only gospel that you need. You've done wrong, I've done wrong. 
We need someone to make us righteous before God. The only person, the only being that has the ability to do that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, for you and I, that's the only gospel we need to take out. In order to be made righteous before God, the world needs the Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore we all should act accordingly. Continuing in Romans chapter 11, we'll pick it back up in verse 16. God's word says, For if the first fruit be holy, the lump also uh, is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, were grafted among them, and with them par- uh, partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell, severity. But toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. If you want to know one of the, one of the cornerstones of free will Baptist doctrine <laughs> that you ever need in terms of endurance and perseverance of the saints, you need to go no further right there than in verse 22. Because it says to continue, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise you shall be cut off. It's all you ever need. You have the ability to be within the tree, the, the family tree of God, and to be cut out because of disbelief. Here's the second thing I want to look at with you here this morning. And I want to bring your attention to is that as Christians, you are grafted, you are linked, you are branches linked. To Israel. Paul speaks here of the first fruits of faith. And in the context of Israel, um, it refers to the patriarchs uh, of the faith. It refers to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, now, some will argue that these first fruits are the early church, and you might believe that this morning, but here's, here's where uh, this idea of the lump comes into play because uh, if you don't know what that is, and I know a lot of you guys are well-versed, so you probably, I'm, I'm telling you something you don't already know. But when new bread is made or was made after the harvest, a portion was put aside and given to the Lord. This was considered holy bread. This was done to, to consecrate, uh, the, consecrate the, whole, uh, the whole bunch, like the root consecrates the tree. And... You can see this action of setting aside the lump. You can see it in the book of Numbers. Uh, I won't read the whole thing, but I'll I'll show you the conclusion. In Numbers chapter 15, verse 21, it says, Of the first of your dough, you shall give unto the Lord a heave offering in your generations. This was set aside so that the whole lump could be consecrated. Abraham was the foundation which sprung up the physical plan, uh, or excuse me, uh, Abraham was the foundation which sprung up the physical plan of salvation. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, here's what God's word says, And I will bless thee, uh, bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee, and in thee uh, shall all families of the earth be blessed. It started with Abraham. God promised the branches of Abraham's, uh, the branches of Abraham blessings. The branches are those who would become the children of God. That's what this illustration of the tree is giving us. Rather they be biologically tied to Abraham or non-Jews adopted into the family of Christ. Those branches have been blessed by God, him being the root. Now this is illustrated also by the explanation of being grafted. Uh, if you look at verses 17 and 19. In the tree illustration where the family of God is explained uh, as a tree, there are some of natural branches, and there are some, uh, and those natural branches being the descendants of Abraham, 
uh, they were cut off. And why were they cut off? Well, we've been talking about it in chapters 9, 10, and 11. They were cut off because they did not believe. And this is talking about the nation of Israel. The Gentile is now grafted into those places. And our branches linked together with the Jewish Christian. But as Gentile believers, once again, we're cautioned. Because like the Jews who did not believe have been cut off, we also can be cut off. Which is why it's important we persevere. Verse 18 urges the Gentile Christian not to be arrogant towards the other branches that have been cut off because it is not the Gentile Christian that is the foundation of the faith. It is instead the root which is the Jewish people. Now the only reason, the only reason that any of us can be saved or grafted into the family of God is because of God's mercy, which was granted and extended to us by the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we need to stand firm in the faith because it is by faith alone that we have been made a part of this holy family. Paul continues in verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Uh, behold, therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these things, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Here's the third thing that we need to recognize and realize of the text this morning. And it's this, as the Christian, we should bear the fruit of loyalty. We should bear the fruit of loyalty. Paul calls on the Gentile Christian to notice the kindness, not only the kindness, but the severity of God. These attributes were written in other places of the Bible, by the way, talking about the attributes of God, severity and kindness. Take, for instance, if you look at the book of Psalms, in 125, uh, 125 verses 4 and 5, God's word says, Do good, O Lord, unto those that be good to them that are upright in their hearts. As for such as turn aside into their crooked ways, the Lord shall lead them forth with the workers of iniquity, but peace shall be upon Israel. We see that yes, we serve a loving God. And to today's society where people have all of a sudden made God politically correct, they've made God open and accepting to all. And by the way, He is, but He's open and accepting to all who put their faith and trust in Him and live in a way that's obedient to His word. We have to understand that just as much as God loves us, grants us grace and mercy, God is also a righteous judge. God's judgment is also severe for those people who, one, don't put faith and trust in Him, but two, do not act uh, in obedience to His Word. Though God is gracious and kind to extend the possibility of reconciliation, He will not adjust morality. Understand this. Because this is a topic that's so hard for people in our time to grasp. Morals do not change. The moral compass does not adjust. God is the same as He's always been, the same as He is now, and the same as He always will be. Uh, uh, God does not adjust morality or deem anything sinful or righteous. If it was once sin, it is still sin. We as Christians are urged to continue in His goodness and kindness for the other attributes results in our peril. Like the Jews who did not believe and were cut out, uh, cut out of the family of God. Then in verse 23 of Romans chapter 11, we see that there is still hope for Israel. Because remember when we started back in chapter 9, uh, the Jews were saying, well, what about us? It seems as if God has somehow neglected us. Well, in verse 23, we see there is still hope for the nation of Israel because even though there were those who were cut off, they have the possibility to be grafted back in. Now, for some of us, that simply defies logic. 
Why, if God would cut something out, would he include it back in? If you're a gardener or someone who plants trees, if you cut a, if you cut a branch off, well, you obviously did it for a reason. There was something wrong with it. Maybe you decided to try to take that and plant it to grow a, a separate tree. Uh, normally you would have a reason, and God had a reason to cut out Israel. So what would it make sense to take that cut branch and graft it back into the tree? But see, human logic never lines up with God's logic. We don't have to understand what seems illogical to man. God somehow makes work together for good. That is an option in God's plan of salvation. It's for someone having an, an opportunity, a second chance. If you're a Christian this morning, understand, we serve a God, we follow God, who is a God of second chances. Amen? And I'm thankful for that. I hope you are, too. We cannot understand God's ways completely. The supernatural acts of grace, like reuniting the branches that have been cut off to the tree, uh, back into the tree, shows that God uh, can work miracles and does work miracles through those who are faithful and those who are loyal. Anyone, the Jew or the Gentile alike, who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and are loyal to God, they are reconciled. They are made part of God's holy family tree. You know, when I say that word loyalty, that means a lot of things to a lot of people. Loyalty really is a funny thing. Uh, and, and I'll close with this. Loyalty is a funny thing. Because loyalty means different things to different folks. It's like the guy who was in the military and he was traveling with a, with a friend. And he looks over at his friend and he goes, you know what? <clears throat> I'm loyal to my girlfriend. And the guy goes, what do you mean? He goes, I'm loyal to my girlfriend. If I'm within 50 miles of home, I never run around with another girl. Within 50 miles of home. But outside of that 50 miles, all bets were off. I don't know what was special about that 50 miles, but that's what he believed loyalty meant. His loyalty went 50 miles. Christian, this morning, let me ask you a question. How far does your loyalty go with Jesus Christ? Does it go the few strides to that door before you get back out in the world and you have to deal with the problems, you have to deal with the confrontations, you have to deal with everything this world hands to you? Is that how far your loyalty goes? Or does it go outside this door? How far does your loyalty with Jesus go? We've been given the possibility to be reconciled, but also the possibility to reject. So which do you do? Every day we get the choice, whether or not. We are going to continue in His goodness. We are going to continue to follow and serve God. Or this is the day we reject and say, we don't need it. We don't want anything to do with it. We're good for right now. Until we need Him again like a, like a spiritual genie. And he pops out and we expect him to grant us some wishes. Hopefully, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, then you are loyal. And one of the ways that a Christian can show faithfulness and loyalty to God is by remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. 